So the train is rolling. We're going to dialogue just a little bit on the message of the kingdom. There's a difference, isn't there? And how we've been taught and what we're learning. There's a difference, and it's a vast difference, okay? As, as we are sitting under the word, as we are um, just getting hungry and more open, it's like God is pulling out strings of unbelief in our thinking. It's like God is highlighting areas. Um, it blessed me, Monica, when it, God was showing you, you guys remember Monica got up and talked about, it wasn't like she knew here that she could get remarried. She's, she's ministered to people for years. 27 years you've been single, okay? But at the time when the church ministered to her what that scripture meant, that you would be in sin to get remarried, right? There was a, a thorn, if you will, that got stuck in her belief system. Okay, so she probably counseled people just the opposite of that. She never preached that. She didn't think she believed it, okay, but that belief was in her belief system, okay? And so what happens is as the word is coming forth, the light of God, it exposes and drives out darkness, okay? The quicker that you can say, oh, and agree with God, don't tell him you already dealt with that, don't be okay with it there, Okay, the quicker you can agree with that and come into humility, the quicker you move into the light. Okay, God is not holding out on us. I know we know that, but we think that often because we don't understand why he didn't come through when we prayed or we don't understand in the trauma why that happened. Right. And those beliefs are like thorns in our thinking. Has any of you guys ever heard of Gary Cassie? Pretty phenomenal. Do you have Karen? Did you listen to him? Huh? Oh, I did. Mm, I told you about him. <laughs> okay, so you might want to write his name down. I, I haven't listened to him in years. So this isn't in line with, um, you know, as we're coming out of the law and things like that. But Gary Cassie, he really teaches on hearing and seeing and then moving into it financially. He's phenomenal. Okay? Well, I just remember one of the stories he told. And his, he was what he would do... He was a hunter, a big hunter, or he still is, I'm sure. He would go in and tell God what he wanted that day. And he would go out and get it every single time. Okay? Sometimes they would just come right up to him, and it was like, you're making this too easy, God. Right? And so he would test it. He would test it and say, this is what I'm going to get. He would go out and get it. Everyone say, every single time. Let's say it. Every single time. So he was teaching his son these principles and his son, um, I, I forget the whole story. You're going to listen to it, and you're going to be like, she was so wrong. But the, here's the basic part of it, okay, if you're anything like my husband. But anyway, his son missed. He didn't get what he, he went in, and, you know, he's practicing, he's doing this, and he didn't get what he was supposed to get. And I believe the next year or the next time he went hunting, the same thing happened. And his dad knew he had to take him completely out of it because it was he couldn't keep building on that foundation. Right. And so because once that set is set in place, it, it produces a cycle in your life. Okay, so the disappointment gets set in place and it invites a cycle. And what we try to do because of the law or our willpower is we try to push harder, right? Believe harder push past it, we, we get all F full of effort, right? It's kind of like, have, you guys, have any of you guys been married, I don't know, over 20 years? I'll be married 30 years this summer. How, how many years? 21. Okay, so you know how you have a discussion, how many years, these two that we have to watch? We had to kick him out of the girl's dorm because he's trying to sleep with his wife. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. He fell asleep in there. But did, did you guys know each other in school? Did you guys know each other in high school? Oh, you think you may. How many years have you guys been together? 26. Woo! This weekend. Yeah. So it's kind of like you, you have a conversation with a friend or a husband, a wife, a parent, whoever, and they can't hear you. It doesn't have to be about God. It could be about anything. You're just trying to share what you feel. It could be a, a view about whatever. And then, you, you know, that topic comes up the next year, five months later, and you try to re-say it from another angle. 
and they still don't hear you, right? And I mean, you guys may not be this stubborn, but we had some of the same conversations when we were willing to admit it for 27 years, you know what I'm saying? You're like, and you couldn't get anywhere because from that, st- that point, there was no budging. You couldn't just drive through it and see different. It's like trying to sit down with somebody that has their mind set on how they believe about God and you're trying to prove to them how they should believe. Has, it, has that worked for anybody? <laughs> but yet we, we try to do it, you know. I mean, I, I, I've done it with my children. Like, I'll say the same thing in a different verbiage. Maybe they won't know it's the same thing. You know what I'm saying? It's been really neat with go, as we went to Kirby because they're, using, and they're from Sri Lanka. And so everybody is kind of letting them off the hook with their terms. All us people that were raised charismatic. And, you know, so maybe their terms are not all the Christianese language that we were raised in or whatever. And so they'll use words like um, frequency, right? And so I'm texting my children as we're at the the conference, and I'm like, it doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what kind of face you put on. It's the frequency that you release. That's how people receive you. But I've said that to them their whole life. I just didn't use the word frequency, and I'm thinking now they're going to see it. You know what I'm saying? But but the, the bottom line in it... Whenever that, whenever that belief or that thorn gets stuck in there that Monica didn't even know was there, okay, it sets in place a pattern. And until that gets pulled out, the pattern continues. And what God's doing right now is he, there, there's a washing of the word like we've never seen. You know, Josie, when we, um, we're going to recap on several things, and I'm going to have some of you guys share some stuff, okay? So let's, bear with me here. When we were at the conference, because so much is happening. Isn't a lot happening? When we were at the conference, we went to a conference in um, Florida. And that, we were just having the conversation before we even, it was, wasn't even in the service. And we were talking about this um, and the blood that was shed to get us this. I mean, not just his blood, you know, um, but his disciples. And then people that, his blood is still being shed over this book. And, and I believe in America, of course, you guys know I raised Josie on Voice of the Martyrs, God love her. You know, it was like children's bedtime stories, you know, and it would, it would start off saying there are more martyrs right now than any time in history. Good night, you know. <laughs> and, and Josie's like, I will give my head, you know. <laughs> That's the truth. That's the truth. I would read these stories to her. Uh, the, um, Fox's Book of Martyrs. How many of you guys have read that? You know, you guys need to read that. Don't make me start reading these stories to you. But we were discussing the blood that was shed for this book in America that I could go into a store and buy 20 of them and not even be that expensive. Or there's five in our house, right? And so we, we were discussing it not because of guilt. If, if you hear guilt ever in any of these messages, that is not the voice of God and it is not our heart, okay? That's a voice in your head that God wants to drive out with his love, okay? Okay. But, but the truth is, in, in America or in countries where we have so much access, often we lose the honor of the price that was paid. So when you lose the honor, it's not the honor in the sense of how I was raised. We didn't open it because you honored the book. <laughs> we were raised Catholic. We had that huge, how many of you guys had one of those huge Catholic Bibles? And I mean, the pictures were beautiful. They were, it was beautiful, but just don't touch it. I, we honored the whole table. By not reading it, that was kind of weird. But anyway. (laughs) But the honor is when the words come forth, they're life-changing. And that's an attitude of the heart. That's an attitude that I'm, I'm bringing back into my life, renewing that in my life so that I can see. That's that childlikeness again. You see, when God comes forth with a truth... Those that are willing to let go of yesterday's truth can see it. And it was the truth yesterday. It's not even just religion, okay? It's, it, sometimes it's, it's manna. It was for that day. You know, one thing that Darren says is that God will he'll meet you where you are to get you, get you where you're going. Right? And so when you're seven and you're a little soccer player and everything in your life's about soccer, whenever he speaks to you, he might talk to you in soccer lingo, right? But when you're 70 
and life's altogether different, he's going to talk to you in a different language, isn't he? And we have to be willing to let go of the last thing. And I don't mean no, don't honor it, we're, not, we're thankful for it, but in order to see, and I'm saying that because the kingdom message is here. Two weeks ago, Darren asked if, if, you, if we understand God's house, what God's offering us. And I want you to take that in, as an individual. Because we will get in on it. But God has called us to lead it. And I understand the weight of that. And some of you understand the weight of that. But those that, that go to the front line, they take the hits. You understand that? How many of you guys took a lot of hits when you began believing in tongues and miracles and moved away from something? Right? And the persecution. Yeah. A new truth, if you're ready to proclaim it and establish that you believe it, <clears throat> you're going to take some hits. And it's not to be afraid because with persecution comes blessing. Right? But in it, God's house the people that God has gathered here, is asking God, asking yourself, do we understand what God's offering us here in Houston? You know, Darren said that God spoke to him in Oklahoma, and he said, no longer is it Houston, we have a problem. It's Houston, we have the answer. <laughs> and that's not arrogant. Uh-huh. We went, we went to Florida. We really went to meet the, um, Kirby and, and Fiona for what they're doing and have done in their nation. And we ended up having joint rooms with them. Is that not the funniest thing? In fact, when we first got to the hotel, Darren's trying to get in the room. It was 1006, but ours was A1006. So we just get there, and he's like kind of frustrated typing it in. And then I hear somebody. I'm like, babe, there's someone in there. It was them. <laughs> that would have been so embarrassing. <laughs> We're like, get this door open, you know. And ours was A, you know. It's the difference when you read a book or you watch a movie. Have you guys ever watched a movie that just really moved you? And then you Google all about it. Especially if it was based on a true story. It just ticks me off. I want to know which part is based on the true story. Was it just that one little bit? And then you get kind of mad. You know what I mean? Or... How much of it is real? I mean, what is the Hacksaw Ridge? Yeah. Yes, I did take some of our youth, the older ones, to go watch a rated R movie, Hacksaw Ridge. Mel Gibson said that there was, it was so supernatural, Hollywood producers said he had to tone it down because people wouldn't believe it. Watch the interview on it. It was so supernatural, Hollywood had to tone it down like, wait a minute, this is too much of a superhero. Since when did that happen? But I want to know when I begin to get moved by um, a message or a movie or a book, I'm, I'm not so interested in the story as I am the author. You know what I'm saying? Where they're coming from. Yeah. And, and digging a, a little deeper in that. And, and, and that's the difference right now, guys, where we, where we are as we're hearing this message. You know, you're going to hear things like, how far do we want to go? <clears throat> how far does this rabbit hole lead us? Right? You saw a rabbit this morning? We've had consistent words <clears throat> about Alice in Wonderland and following the white rabbit. And then, of course, you know in The Matrix, they said, follow the white rabbit, and the girl comes, I think it was a girl, comes to the door, and she turns around, there's a white rabbit. Right? And it's, it leads Neo, the one, out of the matrix, right? And we, we preached in youth on Alice in Wonderland, the second one, and the looking glass, like seeing beyond. Um, and that's the, que that's the question for you. Like, how far do we want to go? How far do we want to go? The message that, that we're going, it's going to increase, it's going to get, you're going to hear it more and more quickly because of the internet because those that are hungry I mean you guys what I do is I'll sit and listen to somebody and everyone they mention if they're if they're mo if I'm moved by them everyone they mention I write their names down and find them 
and just networking it and pulling in what's happening in the earth. We've never lived in a time like this that we can draw from little obscure places and what they're operating in. I told you I'm purposefully provoking myself because I don't want to be okay to settle. So when I'm talking about knowing the author, when I'm hearing the messages that is coming out of Sri Lanka, it's not like I need to sit down and have hours of meetings with them. I'm not trying to, you know, but I wanted to see the people. Because you know, the, to a degree, we knew the, a price that we've paid. And we're ready. And this message is setting people free. The message of the kingdom. So can anyone tell me just maybe one thing, it can, just real quickly, that is different with the message of the kingdom than the message that we've heard for years? Unity, like with each other or with him? They won't have to do this. Um, I got a revelation recently. I was going to say it last week. Uh, those of you that uh, are married and you've been, you know, years together and you're thinking each other's thoughts, and, and to me, I still don't understand it. It trips me out that Laura and I, not just basic things. I mean, we're still, we say the same thing. We're thinking the same thing. And that's how we are with Father. And as I'm getting it revealed to me that I'm like, oh, my goodness, how much greater can it be with him? And I see it in our body. I see it with Darren. Even last week before we went on this trip, we're talking about that guy that uh, lost his congregation because he went to this different belief. I'm not going to get into that. But I just met a guy at a, uh, uh, at a gas station, was offering help with him. We start talking, carry on like a 30-minute conversation. He's going to go be a pastor, but he tells me about this, and he's moving into this uh, somewhat into this. I mean, definitely grace and love, love, God's love. And then Darren talks about it this weekend, and that's happened before. And I'm going, man, this is so cool. But the thing is, people outside of us that don't have the revelation that we are married with Christ, we are one with him, they don't get it, and that's why they're not moving in it, and that's why things aren't happening for them. And that we are, and this movement that we got going on is going to be awesome. It's, it's not going to happen. It's happening, and it keeps happening, and it's getting bigger and bigger, and I'm so excited. And, and, and the love, uh, too, that just from this past weekend at, at the, um, up there in Atoka, that the people showed us, and the connection I feel with them now, and I come back here and feel so much freer. Because just the love that's through this. So I'm touching on a lot of things, but it is awesome. Get excited and keep seeking them and seeking them and seeking them. Because, uh, you know, we struggle every day and get caught up in our lives but uh, with what's going on. But, man, he's so great. He is so great. And the closer we get to Father, the more unity we're going to have and the freer we're going to be. I'm just so excited for all of us. Are you praising God or are you raising your hand? Praising God while you raise your hand. That's enough. That's one for you. The one is that um, <clears throat> what I see, I see what is the evidence is the difference, okay? That when um, they say that we are co-inheritors, that they mean it, and that is what the message of the, the Bible actually says, and also that Sheila is a co-pastor and not just the wife of the pastor. That's one thing. In religion... We don't do that in churches. That's the, the pastor's wife. Also, that the Godhead literally lives inside of us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and not just Holy Spirit. Yes. And it's very clear in Colossians, but who reads, right? Um, also, I could bring someone who dresses completely inappropriately here, and they would be completely loved and not chastised and not looked at unkindly. And that has not always been the case um, at all. So I stopped asking um, people in that state to come to church because I didn't want them to be hurt. And the last thing is, well, I've got a thousand things, but we are already forgiven. Yeah. And it really reminded me that when I look back at my first Bible, which was King James, so anybody can get born again, seriously, I got born again in the King James, is that I, I have it right the very first time God spoke to me, he told me I was forgiven. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's right there. And then I got born again. Because I saw that I was forgiven, and then I went into knowing that there's absolutely no condemnation, and then I could love my family, because if there's no condemnation in me, there's no condemnation in them. 
tripped me out like, I love that word. And the last thing I'm going to say is that see the kingdom, it's out there, not in here. And so as a person in ministry, I, my first struggle was, well, what do I do here? And their struggle was, what are you going to do out there? Why do you want to be in here? I'm like, well, I don't know. It's all I know. So it's literally taken me three years, solid years, of my mind being realigned in the Word of God that says, I have a message. And yes, I carry the message of the house, but it's because it's become my message, not because I'm carrying the words of a man or a woman that told me I need to carry their message so that I can go to church here. And that really is the difference. And if you really want to know the difference between the kingdom and religion, it's all about relationship. They're not here to control us. They are here to mature us and grow us up in the love of God so that we can go out there and love people in the love of God and receive people in the love of God and invite them here or set them in somewhere else. And if we wanted to have our own church, they'd say, let's sow into that because they have a no-compete policy. The blood has settled it all. There you go. I like that. That's a T-shirt, no-compete policy. Can the camera see over here all the way? Because if not, we'll, make, we'll have them come up. Come on up. Look right into the camera. So, so, Peter, what do you believe the message of the kingdom is? <laughs> uh, hi, folks. No. Um, so, uh, I, I, what I've realized is um, Darren has spent a lot of time talking about the, um, the poison that religion is on several levels. And, and really how you don't even know to what extent you've been drinking the tainted water, shall we say. Um, but to me, um, I think um, really if you've grown up with, with religion and even if you've grown up in the world, you've grown up with a great unfortunate skepticism towards how God really is. You know, you haven't seen him as a loving dad. And, and what I really think that, that an expression that my wife and I have heard through other sources and that Darren and Sheila have said, but really when you start to believe that it is too good to be true, because whenever you get into a business deal, you hear, oh, it's too good to be true. That means instantly skepticism. Don't believe them, don't believe them. But, but I'm starting to learn that when God says it is too good to be true, then it's beyond your truth to his truth. And so I would say that, um, that if, if you can... When I say you, if I can get to the point of believing that for real and that everything falls into place and it becomes like the gentleman that declares what he's going to go out and hunt and get versus begging God, then I think it's just, it's just so amazing. All right. Come on right up here. Dun, da, da. Da, 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 da. Hello. Um, two things. One is freedom, and it's true freedom. It's not freedom of, oh, now I can just abuse and just do whatever I want to do. And the other thing is, in the kingdom, it's limitless. Yeah. It's not, you know, in religions, like this crusty mentality where, you know, this is just enough, right? In the kingdom, it's like boundless, limitless, it's never-ending, and even in our walk with God, it's like, oh, we thought we loved him yesterday. It's like, oh, I didn't even know that was available. It's like, you're so awesome. End of story. I only have two words. We were brought up with restrictions in our lives. Now we have freedom. Yeah, yeah that's right. Freedom to be fully who you are. Come on up here, sister. She's going to start singing. Ah. No, I'm not. Does not sound like that? No, just kidding. I, I, the best I, got. It's the best I got. I think some of the biggest things that I got from this kingdom message, number one, is I'm not trying to get up out of here. It is not about rapture. It is about the earth is my inheritance yeah. and that I am to rule and to reign right here, that the fullness of the Godhead is in me and the earth is my inheritance. So I ain't trying to get up out of here. I'm trying to rule and reign. You understand what I'm saying? It's, it's that, that shifted my whole mindset right there. Because it's like, now that you're here, now you really rule. And that the earth is to yield to me. 
as a son, I decree it, and the earth yields to me. So that was really cool. The other thing was union. One thing, this woman right here, if she carries anything, the message of union. I have really learned about love through Sheila and teaching her, her teachings on union. I mean, she did that. That Oh, man, I, we need to do that again. You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. The chamber, yeah. It was all about union. And when you learn, you know, like when you guys are married, I'm not married yet. <laughs> In heaven I am. It's already done. I'm just calling it forth. So, uh, but when you're married, you, you, you know, you have what they have. You guys, everything is, is one. You're one. And so everything that he has, I have. Everything I have, he has. And so that's the cool thing right there, really believing union, that I'm in union with the fullness of the Godhead. And everything that he says I can have, I can have it because I already have it. And that I'm a word from the word, and he watches over his word to perform it. So what he's already spoken before I was even born that I came into agreement with, I can have it and I can walk in it. And I'm just believing that, you guys. You, you hear what I'm saying? I've been under this message for three years, and I'm like, Darren, didn't nobody tell me nothing. I didn't know this message, you know. <laughs> what? Who got the ashes? Not just kidding. But <laughs> that's a joke. Darren and Sheila know what I'm talking about. But, you know, I didn't know that. And I didn't know that I had that kind of authority and that it's, it's because of this dirt suit, but it's also because of him. Do you understand? I got that kind of power. So it's you and his goodness. Oh, my gosh, that I cannot measure his goodness. I can't measure that he's good or not good to me because of what he does for Sheila and that what I see in my life or don't see in my life. He's good regardless of what I see. He's good regardless of my disappointments, regardless of how I feel, what I think even. He's good. His goodness is sure, period, period, and you can't measure it. It's immeasurable. So, that's what I got. Love it. Love it. Come on up here. Awesome. So I think for me and what I've seen with the kingdom message is that we are new creations. And I think in the past we all kind of all heard that, and we just kind of gloss right through that, yeah. not understanding that new, the word for new is kainos, which means totally brand new, did not exist before. It's not an iPhone upgrade. It's like going from an iPhone to a rocket ship. Okay? And creature is a species. And when you actually look at what the word says that you are, not just me or Sheila, it's you. When you accept Christ, you actually transform into something totally brand new, a brand new species that did not exist before. And when you think about that, that means Christ has done it all. That means you cannot screw it up. That's the freedom. You cannot mess it up. So it takes all performance out. So you're not trying to become something you, you want to be. You're, you're believing something that you already are. That's the kingdom. The more you believe it, what the word says, the more your behavior reflects, not the other way around. You can't get any more righteous than you are. So the real question is, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? That is how we walk in the kingdom, because you can't fail. So to me, that is the most exciting thing about the kingdom. What would you do if you couldn't fail? We hear it's limitless. Jesus said, we will do everything he has done and more. Jesus walked on water. He disappeared. He did some crazy stuff. He loved with a love that I can't explain. But because our nature has now become one with his, that's how you love. Yeah. And you lack nothing. Yeah. That's the beauty of the kingdom. So tell me. Yeah. Um, I won't tell us. How many children do you have? Four. Okay. So tell us how that as you're moving more and more in this revelation, how that affects your relationships where it's not based on behavior and I'm walking it out. So I am learning that, and my, my kids will tell you that, that that is a, it is something I am having to learn. And as they are normal kids and as I mess things up, not beating ourselves up and feeling like, oh, I've got to do X, Y, and Z to regain all these things. And, it's, it changes that relationship. Like I said, I'm not perfect in that by any means, uh, but it's learning how to love 
and how to accept them for who they are and teach them who they are. And so when they mess up, when they beat themselves up, instead of getting mad at them, it's more of a, that's not who you are. And speaking into who they are instead of trying to say, oh, you're a liar, you're a whatever. It's saying, that's not who you are. Stop behaving that way because that's not who you are as a son or a daughter of the king. And so I'm learning how to do that because it's deprogramming 40, nearly 44 years of, of programming. Yeah. And it takes some time sometimes yeah. with that. Uh, but that's, it's, yeah. I've seen that change in my life and in my, my kiddos' lives. And it's, I hope it continues to change more and more, as, <laughs> as Clay will attest to. <laughs> it's all identity. It's identity. That's one of the, right? It's all identity. So it's like if Noah here began acting, acting like a, where do the sumo wrestlers come from? Japan? Yeah. Okay, so if he started acting like a Japanese sumo wrestler, would that make him a Japanese sumo wrestler? No. No more than if he is lying or cheating or acting like a jerk, would that make him a liar or a cheater or a jerk? Okay. The more he realizes, you're not a Japanese sumo wrestler. That's ridiculous. Why are you acting like that? You know, um, the more he realizes who he is as a son, the alignment comes. And I mean, it's, I love that we get to walk this out with each other because we're proving the message. God doesn't want you to try to work on your love. He doesn't want you to try harder. He wants you to go to him and let, let him give it to you. So when my mother went to bury her father, who was a highly, highly abusive man to all his children, and he was in a coma, and she went up there, and God was going to you know, have her release him in some things before he passed on. And she said, God, I, I can't. I can't forgive him. And he said, then forgive him with mine, my forgiveness. And she was able, just like you would go and turn around and get a bucket of water and then turn around and give it to him. The love that we carried... You know, it's, if, for lack of a better word, it's bar- we borrowed it. We, we, it. It didn't start with us. So I don't have to work up more love for my family or for those that have abused me. I don't have to work up anything. The more that I see who I am and how adored I am when I wake up and see his smile over me, the more I am full of his love and I have nothing else to give. And not, don't feel condemned if when you get punched, you want to punch back. All right? Because we're walking this out. But one of the greatest things that you can do for your children is repent in front of them and say we're changing and we're free to make mistakes. And even at, as God's house in this family is we want you to know that we're, we're free to make mistakes because we're walking this out. It's awesome. Oh, thank God you're so good. You're so good. Everyone close your eyes for me. Everybody, everybody close your eyes. Close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. Okay. Father God, you're so good. I want you to imagine this picture. How many know that God speaks to us through our imagination, our dreams, our visions? He speaks to us all the time. I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine the deepest, tallest, mightiest purple mountains. Oh, they're so beautiful. The deepest purple mountains. And now that there is a river flowing through these mountains. It's the bluest of waters. Just hear the water, the water flow through the river over the rocks. And that there are vibrant, beautiful fish swimming through this river ever so peacefully. And that there is a green pasture and there are beautiful trees on each side of this river. The vi- most vibrant colors are these, these fruits that are on these trees that are good. These are all good. And that in these trees, that there are animals frolicking through this pasture. And it is beautiful and it is peaceful. And God has made all of this and God has said, this is good. This is good. But how much better, how much more beautiful, how much better could this be if you were in it? How much more beautiful could it be if you were in it? I want you to hear God say your name. How much more beautiful would it be if Blank was in this picture. And that the Father loves us so much that things that we think are beautiful, God says, no, you are more beautiful than this. There's a worship song that we sing, what a beautiful name it is. And we're worshiping to God. And there was one time I was worshiping, and he does this to everyone. 
And that we're worshiping, we're saying, what a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is. In the name of Jesus Christ, our King, and God's, God is saying, you're worshiping to me, but I'm singing right back to you. I'm singing right back to you. In fact, he's saying, what a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Sheila, my daughter, my princess. He does that to every single one of us. He sings to every single one of us. And all we have to do is listen. Yeah. So, Father, you are so good. You're so good. Mm, that's awesome. <laughs> so how do you beat that? I know. Everybody can <laughs> um, For years, I kept hearing people say relationship with God, and I never understood. And I kept thinking, okay, if I wake up every day at 6 in the morning and read the Bible, or, you know, I wake up at 4 in the morning and pray, that's where I'll find my relationship with God. And I found freedom. It's not waking up at 6 in the morning. It's if I wake up at 6, it's because I want to hear from him and I want to know who he is. But it's not what I do. It's not my work because he said it's done. I did it. And so this kingdom message has given me that freedom to know my father. When you come from a home like I did, where that father relationship has never been there, you never quite understand because God was always untouchable for me. Yeah. He was someone up in heaven that I just couldn't know and I couldn't reach and I couldn't do enough to get to him. Because every time I thought I'd do something good and then something bad and then I'd fall back into saying, no, can't do it. Sorry, God, you know, forgive me again. And, and I finally understood that he said, when he, Jesus said, it's done, yeah. it's done. Yeah. It's not what I can do. It's what he does in me. Right. And he's no longer up there, but he's in me. Yeah. And that's, that's what I've learned with the kingdom message, yeah. that I have have that intimacy with him. I have that moment with him. I have felt Jesus' arms wrapped around me. I have felt us becoming one. Yeah. I can't even explain. I wish you all were there when, I, when that happened to me because I, I couldn't stop screaming in my home. And just knowing that, just standing here, not even my words are enough to say what he has done in my life. And so that's kingdom message. That's freedom. That's real love. That, that's, and this is why you guys are family. Because when you're in that kingdom message, this isn't a church. This is family. Because we're all connected. And when one hurts, we all hurt. And when one is happy, we're all happy. And that's what Kingdom Message does. It gives you that freedom to know that this is true family. Yes. All of you guys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Pat, tell us about your daughter. Oh, okay. So little ones, you know how little ones, they, they, um, we think they don't hear and they hear. And two weekends ago, we were sitting here when Darren, how old is she? she's eight years old. Um, when Darren was talking about God's house, she didn't want to go to the children's room. And so she sat here and she said, hey, mom, can I just start writing in your journal? And I said, yeah, go, you know, go ahead and start writing in your journal. And she started speaking about the freedom she has in Christ and how she's God's house. Um, and so I'll just read a little piece. She said, life is great, but it's good because Jesus in our, is in our life and we have freedom. And we don't need to ask Jesus. He will give it to us and we will have it if we accept it. <laughs> And then she says, we are God's house. And how do you explain God's house? It's like God lives inside of us, and we are his house. And we breathe the air of him. Yeah. That was my daughter's words. That's, there you go. Yes. Oh, I love it. I love it. Do you want to Guys, as we, we're developing our, the website right now, and it is. I heard, I was driving down the road, um, I don't know, a couple months ago, I may have told you this already, but I heard God say, because you know, what, what, what have we said from the beginning? We didn't come here to build a church. But then we're like, well, what are we doing? You know what I mean? Like, what do you want us to do? You know, we want to gather. We want to worship his name. We want to connect people to father. We want to see lives change. I know culture will call that church, but that's not what we came here for as far as to that pressure on how to get it right and build something. Anyway, I heard God say that God's house, and um, he's given, showing us how to do the website and connect with people, um, it's, a, it's a movement, it's not a place. 
because you, you are God's house. Delight, she is God's house. It's not the name that's supposed to be on a building. It's us. And it's, it's Washington. And I will say, whoever's listening in Washington, we can look on the news feed, um, that God is speaking to us about Washington. And in God's timing, we're going to come up there and do a series of meetings. And we are so excited. There's a group of, I don't know, about 19 people that get together and listen and so into God's house, and they've come to our conferences, and that's what I believe is going to begin to happen as we're putting these messages out there, that people are like, I'm God's house. Um, I, I love the word, and I, I have a lot of it memorized, and I used to read it quite a bit. Now, I know I'm not the only one who's done this. I've been sitting here listening to Darren, and he says something, and my mind goes, but what about this scripture? And what about that? And I, you know, it, it's like we're fishing and suddenly the hook goes boom. And I want to stop and I want to question it. And it's like, wait, 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 stop. And what I can't get away from is that even though I may not understand all of it, one thing he's always saying is that there are the word meets the word, that one thing is connected to another. And that's I have had visions for years of of preaching solid word and saying this verse says this because this verse says this because this verse and you know lacing them together because I know that's how the father speaks to me so he's always saying to have the, he, you know these encounters he's always saying these encounters he never tells us about you know but you know they're real you know that he's experiencing them and so I have a friend who I dearly love who is actually working on a system to memorize the entire word of God. And whenever Darren is preaching, I'm hearing this guy in my head, you know, the last days, blah, blah. And have my friend, he really knows the word. But I can't say that he has a lot of fruit in his life. He just knows the word. You see what I'm saying? And, and I'm like, well, dude, you know, for all the word you should know, you should really get people saved or something, you know. What you're, you, but anyways, so Darren is always saying, go into those experiences, and I have them, and I can't tell you often, I've had an experience during the week, and then I'll come here, and Darren will preach on the very thing, or even just during worship, and so what it's finally let me do is, okay, Darren will say something, and then that thing will pop up, you know, but wait a minute, what about this, are you saying that this and this, right, I know all of you are doing that, I know you're doing that, and so now I can go, okay, daddy, you know what, Darren has shown me over and over again that he honors the word and he loves the word, right? I mean, he's preaching. He's coming at you with the word, right? There's no question about the fact that everything he has said is established on the word. So we don't have to compromise on that, right? Because that's always my fear. Oh, it's got to be based on the word. It's got to be based on the word. But what I love now is that I've married encounter with the word, and now the word is becoming more vibrant. It was like I had building bricks, and now I have living stones. And what it does is it encourages, um, sometimes in my encounters, I will experience a truth that I have seen in the word and not like feasted on it, not really just like mind blown, right? And I, I, I just feel as if, Man, I've been listening to God's word all my life, and now I'm experiencing. I've got permission to experience it. I've got permission. I'm being invited to meet with him and, 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 and go into this other realm and be changed. And now I'm dying to see my friend, not because of what I want to tell him, but just, you know what I want to do? I just want to be. I don't, want to, I don't want to quote anything. I don't want to have a theological discussion with him. I just want to be. I just want to have that truth marinating in me and just changing things in me. And I wake up sometimes and I'm like, wow, when did that change? Yeah. When did I stop being angry about that? Why is, when did this go away, this issue, right? And that's, it's not an effort. I just wake up and it's like, oh. Okay, glad we got rid of that. And truth does that to me. Truth just like cuts off these lies. And I'm minding my own business. And I'm like, oh, hey, when, when did I lose that? That's cool. And, some, and that's what he's always saying, that when you're in truth, the word washes you. It washes you. And you're like, oh, yeah, it did. When? I don't know. But it's good. It's gone. So that's what I love about the kingdom message. It's word married with the encounter of it. Patricia King said one thing. She says, you don't go down the altar and marry a guy 
and go, okay, now we're married. I don't want to experience you. You know, we're officially married now. We got the paper. No, we get married and we experience our lover, you know, and it's vibrant. The spirit is the animation of the word. Think about that word animation. And you guys remember, Darren said that God had him for a year. Pastors got, a couple pastors got real mad about this, that he said it from the pulpit to set the word down for a year. And he was still preaching. (laughs) And he would just, I mean, he knows it. He's, he's like, he's like you, he's devoured it through the years, but God told him to stop it because when he would go back into it, he said, you already know what it means. You know, and that's why it's not an age thing. We know that it's the eternal life, us in the spirit, it's not an age thing. I know there's been like, we call them youth movements and things like that. But what happens, guys, is a lot of times people that haven't been trained move right into it. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's a position of our heart. And what I feel, Lucy, that the position of your heart is you're a worshiper. And because you're a worshiper, that's what moves you into seeing even more. It's the foundation of the word. In fact, let's look at this real quick in um, Luke 17, 11, with the 10 leopards. <laughs> yeah. Did I, lepers, lepers, the leopards. I actually looked, I typed it in and there, it showed a guy with lip. Okay. That's from Oklahoma. I guess it's from being in Oklahoma. Thank you for pointing that out, Peter. Although I do that to Darren all the time. Okay. All right, let's look at this. 11, 1711. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met, met him. They stood at a distance and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Show us mercy. That word means relieve our affliction. Throw me a bone here. How many of us have ever prayed like that? Can you see we have leprosy? We heard that you can heal. Throw me a bone here, Jesus. You know, show me some mercy. 14, when he saw them, he said, go and show yourself to the priests. Boom, it was done. At his word, boom, here's your mercy. And as they went, they were cleansed. Everyone say cleansed. That word cleansed means they were free from filth or they were set free from sin. So at his word, they were forgiven of their sins and freed from the leprosy. They were cleansed. He, he released grace, and he cleansed them. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. Go and show the priests. He released mercy. He released grace, and they were forgiven. They were cleansed, okay? And that's where... A lot of churches are stopping right now, and they're camping out just on grace. And that's the difference with the the kingdom message. It it is all about grace, and it is complete grace, and it is all him. But they were cleansed, and only one of them turned back, okay? And this is when we move into a little more dominion. 15, one of them, when he saw that he was healed... He came back praising God in a loud voice, and he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. So as I'm saying with you that you're a worshiper, that you're full of thankfulness, that you're full of gratitude, one of them, all of them were cleansed, free from their sin. All of them received the mercy, received the grace, which was God, and it was a beautiful thing. But one of them stopped and went back, and he was praising him. Okay? That word praise means they began to recognize who is this man. They didn't just receive grace. They re-centered, this man recentered his life to glorify. That's what that word means. To exalt him. So there's a receiving of a grace. There's a revelation of his blood that is setting us free. I mean, it is. we are free. We are free from the law. We are free from Adam, we're not, we're a whole different race. We are free. But that's the open door that we walk into and we move into freedom. Okay? But the very word freedom, D-O-M, represents dominion. So you are free 
to take dominion. So he is releasing his freedom, not just for the sake of you to be free, although it's his mercy is for everybody. It did say he forgave the whole world. It's there for everybody. It's his freedom, his forgiveness, his love, his blood was shed for the earth even. For everybody, all of mankind was changed at that time. He finished it. But this one man turned and he recognized, and that word means he glorified. He began to celebrate. He began to magnify, not his freedom, but the person. So he went from, oh, my God, I'm free. Like, could you imagine? You're, you know, our, our kids went into a Hunter and, and Josie were there. Alex didn't get to go on that trip. But we, they took a mission trip to India, and they went into a leprosy colony. Now I'm nervous to say leopard. <laughs> what was I wrong? They went into a leprosy colony, and literally these people didn't have limbs. And I mean, there was a sign out front. Remember, you guys have heard Darren tell a story. And one of the young people passed, kind of pushed right past Darren, grabbed this woman's hand who has nubs, and it's stinky in there. And they, you know, their skins rotted off and began to love on them. And, I mean, I have a video of it. It's pretty neat. I'm, I may just, like, put it on Facebook so you guys can see it. And they're worshiping, and these, these, the presence of God was already there. They thought, we're here to bring the presence of God, but the presence of God was already there. But can you imagine when the freedom is released of your sins, of everything that had Adam, from Adam until that point, he released cleansing from filth. And all of a sudden, your limbs grow back. I mean, what state were they really in? Their nose grows back. They didn't even know that they were handsome. They were like, dang. (laughs) You know, they didn't even know what they looked like. They couldn't remember maybe. You know, and they began to celebrate their freedom, which was a good thing. But one of them turned to say, who is this? Who is this that has the power to cleanse me? My whole life I wanted one thing. I thought. And that was freedom from this filth, freedom from this affliction. But now that I have freedom, I realize the one thing that I I always wanted was him. And this one turned back and he began to exalt Jesus and celebrate Jesus and honor Jesus. Number 15, 17, 15, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he came back. (laughs) He kind of went, whoa, and then he turned right around while the other ones were celebrating their freedom. He threw himself, let's see, he saw that he was healed. He came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? He's teaching us right now. He knew that all ten were cleansed, okay? He's not trying to shame them. Cleansing was for them. Healing, forgiveness, it's for everybody. He said, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Just forgive them. Just release them. These people that we love, these people we don't think we like, they don't have to earn it. Forgiveness is theirs. Give it to them. Jesus paid the price for their forgiveness. Give it to them. Set them free. Set them free. Jesus said, we're not all the ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except for this foreigner? What Jesus is saying is, where'd they go? He cleansed them for a greater purpose. The cleansing, the freedom's for everyone, but the word free to take dominion. Dominion over what? Like once you see your identity, once you begin to receive his love, then what? Then what? was no one found to return to give praise to God except for the foreigner. He was not shaming them, you guys. From the beginning of time, God was offering a door of fellowship, a door of union. From the beginning of time. And he was offering it to these ten. And then he said, rise and go, your faith has made you well. So he looks at this man that's like, this is awesome, who are you? And he began to celebrate his his king, his God, right? He began to recognize that this is him. And and in it, Jesus said, your faith, your trust, we were singing about it, your belief 
has made you whole. That word whole is sozo. Spirit, soul, and body. He just entered into wholeness. He was no longer just cleansed, which is for everybody. It was bigger than forgiveness. You guys know that bumper sticker? I'm not perfect. I'm just forgiven. Well, you're called to be perfect. Not by your own effort, but you're called to move into that marriage and operate with the perfect one because he made me perfect. Not by my own efforts, but by his blood. What is he offering us? God, I want to be the one. I want my heart to be the one. I don't want to assume I'm the one. I want to be the one that stops at whatever he's doing and just exalts him. That's where we see you guys. I'm talking to you. There's some of us that we can't see. We know that it's there. It feels like it's right there, but we can't see him. And God's saying, if you'll just lay all that down and just exalt him. Listen, you were created to know him in all things. The other day I was eating uh, pizza outside when we were in Florida at the very end of the fast, you know. And I looked down, and there's like this little, it wasn't a caterpillar. It was quite a bit smaller, but it had little things. And it was furry. I don't know what it was. But I love that stuff. And the more that I get healed, the more like a kid I get, you know. And so I have my phone, and I'm like recording this. I don't know who cares to see it. But I'm like, you guys know when you were a kid and that little, yeah. what's a bug that's so cute? What is it? Yeah. And you're just like going, Wow, and you can experience God in the smallest things. We were created to know him in all things. But we get so familiar. We're not just familiar with this, where we're not experiencing him. We get familiar with each other. We get ex- Right now we're breathing in oxygen. Today was a gift that I can know him. When you shift and you get that attitude in your heart and you just begin to walk in that, you will begin to see. Listen, there's more. Truth is just coming forth. I mean, God's just moving. There is a train that's moving forward, a kingdom message that's, you know, that's coming in this nation. And God is raising up sons and daughters. But the greatest key, you guys, is that heart to worship. And what I love, what I'm so honored when I look at you guys, um, you know, Karen, she mentioned, like, because Gary didn't get up and walk, right? And she's like, you know, like, at different times, is that a reproach or what that they would feel like, different things. But I think it's what Joseph, what you were singing about, that we are the miracle. When he sees us, we are the miracle. And the most beautiful thing that I saw with Gary and with you, Karen, is when you worship, when you don't get up. When you just exalt him. I mean, right now you can just look at the blood veins in your hand and go, oh my gosh, there's blood that's pumping from my heart to every inch of my body. And worship him. It does not matter what you have gone through or are going through. Guys, listen, we get locked in asking for that one thing when we go into his presence. And we, but we don't realize there's thorns in our belief system. So we're locked in, and we, we've got to find a different starting place. And that starting place is just recognizing him like that man with leprosy did. Just recognizing him. You know what happened? The side note was that he was healed. <laughs> that became the side note. The God of the universe that places the stars in the sky is in my midst. Oh, my God. I exalt you, Lord. Everything that I'm doing, God, just goes to the wayside, Lord. All the thoughts in my mind and the busyness of my soul and the answers that I think I need, none of them matter. I don't wait to sense your presence, Lord. I see the caterpillar, and I know that you are God. I see the stars in the sky, and I recognize your majesty. I see the scene like Noah's talking about with the beautiful mountains. I, I've been on Mount Baker. I've seen the waterfalls. I've, and I'm like, oh, the majesty that you did this for us. 
God has not overlooked you because he hasn't answered that one thing that you're locked in on. Unbelief has ripped us off and religion has ripped us off. But I'm telling you how to position your heart in order to see. You worship in the prison cell. You don't wait for the doors to open. You worship in the prison cell and the doors open. That's your strategy, guys. That's the biggest strategy we have. You know, this is what's been so sweet as we've been listening to Kirby and and Fiona. And I told, I wrote them a thank you card. And I said, it's like you've given us permission to be ourselves again. All we need to do is pray in the spirit and just read the word. And we weren't so smart that we were trying to interpret the word. (laughs) We just really thought the word would change us. So we would tell our teenagers, we're going to read, you know, the book of Galatians every day for 30 days and don't try to get anything out of it. Just read it. Because we were taught about meditation and allowing the Holy Spirit to animate the word. I didn't know that word back then. That was a really cool word. And so I had that, I had that, that, that this is going to change me. It's like these nations that they can't put their hand on the Bible. They may find something out of um, the Old Testament that we're like, what? That changed you? You know, Leviticus changed my life, you know. It's the word. Listen, as the truth that's coming forward, do not position yourself for the next revelation. Just worship him. Just understand that this word, as you stick around, it's going to wash away the crap. It's going to get rid of the religion because he's jealous for you. I promise you that he wants you whole more than you want to be whole. That he wants you to walk, operate in the freedom that he made available with his blood more than you want it. So as these belief systems come up, you got to say, not today. Not any longer. No longer. That's it. He's good, and he's only good, and you have to tell yourself that. That's how you position yourself for the more. <clears throat> this, we took notes, but I, I, somebody said, I don't know if it's, you know, that they have meetings where they ask you not to take any notes. Now, if you're taking notes, don't feel bad. But just let it wash you. You're going to get it. I'm, um, <clears throat> Jared spoke. Wasn't it good in Oklahoma when Jared spoke? Actually, guys, in June, he, he, Jerry and Tammy are going to be with us when we do our joint, the joint service over here. They want to just come be with us. And, um, and then in June, he's going to come speak. Um, I'm very excited about that. But he asked if there's been a disconnect with the message. Like, who's feeling that disconnect? Like, you feel like it's right there. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You're hearing it. You want it to operate. But there's like a disconnect, you know, and especially when people are talking about going into other realms and stuff like that. I had somebody say, I'm sorry, I haven't been to heaven yet. They're like, I'm sorry, you know. You guys know that those pictures that you, we, we, they used to, they came out with years ago and you couldn't see what it was. But then if you rested your eyes, it'd be like a dinosaur. That's what this is. You know, Dar- Darren mentioned that. He would go, I'm going to have encounters. You started seeing that it's impossible. I'm going to have encounters. And he would like, go spend time with God, nothing. Go spend time with God, no no experience. Go spend time with God. And then he finally was like, fine. And then just went in and just worshiped. Wasn't looking for anything. Not looking for answers at this point. Worship isn't looking for answers. It's just him. He's the end all, right? And then he began to have encounters. And I'm saying that just because my heart, I, I, I want you guys to hear that that's the key right there. Stop. Stop the thought process. Even in your prayers. We, we started prayer um, two buildings ago. We started having prayer kind of corporately before church. And I stopped it really quick. <laughs> Not because I didn't believe in prayer. <clears throat> but we can pray just from our soul. And it's just exhausting. Go have a burger. I'm like, stop. If you're saying the same prayer, it's, it's, God's not mad at you. He, but he wants, just shift. Like, okay, it doesn't matter. Until some things in your life are okay either way. Big things. Just because he's God. 
Sometimes we can't see until that happens. Are y'all out there? So Romans 6, 20, he said, we don't, you don't have to turn there, but it talks about being, well, let's look, let me look at it. I, w- I would like to do another worship song at the end. What do you guys think about that? Because that was really fun. Romans 6, 20. He talks about 20. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. So he's talking to the church in Rome. He was talking when you were after Adam, when you were under the law. You couldn't be, you couldn't be controlled by righteousness. 21, what benefit did you reap at that time from the things that you're now ashamed of? Those things resulted in death. That lifestyle resulted in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, just like the men with leprosy, we are set free from sin. We are no longer under the law. We're coming into the realization that we are not to be ruled by that old nature. Darren said we've been shadow boxing. We've been blaming the devil. We've been blaming, you know, our grandma. We've been blaming everything else and doing all this spiritual warfare. But the more we realize that we're free from all that, we don't have to do that anymore, that we are a new species like Martin was talking about. We are a new race. We have completely received his grace. We are free. We are no longer slaves. We don't have to keep doing that. We don't owe those cycles anything. It doesn't matter if it was handed down through the generations. The blood of Jesus is greater than the, what you inherited from your fathers. And we ta- I know what Scripture says about the sins of the fathers handed down and all that, but that was pre-cross. The more we get the revelation of the blood, the more we operate in our true identity. The more we understand that we are already free, that there's already nothing missing. And then you just celebrate, right? But then he goes on to say, let's see where we are. 22, but now that you have been set free from sin, say, I've been set free. And you have become slaves to God. (laughs) He didn't stop about being set free. That word is bondservant. It's the same thing that Jesus did, who he was. He said, I don't do anything unless I see my father doing it. I can't do anything of myself. The son of God cannot do anything of himself. He said, unless I see my father do it, I don't do it. He, by choice, chose to be a bond slave, a bond servant. That's where you have no opinion. You worship. He's the center. You see. You do. You worship, he's the center, you see, you do. You worship, he's the center, you see, you do. You worship, he's the center, you see, you do. That was Jesus' life. I mean, he could have said, guys, I really want to go get Lazarus. I really like him. I'm sorry that you're hurting. I need to explain to you. I just don't have a piece about this. And, you know, he could have went on and on and gave them an explanation. I don't even know why God would tell me not to go right now. Maybe it's because they're going to take me, and I don't want to die before his time, you know. He didn't do that. Isn't that what we do in our soul? We hear God and then we're just like, I don't know. Your reasoning, like, oh my God, your reasoning, my reasoning is exhausting. You worship. In other words, you decenter from self, you see him. Once you see, you do. And then it gets shorter. It's a dance. It's relationship. Until the point you're like, when you see me, you see the Father. Now, I'm sure that when we're, uh, you know, if we're acting like a jerk in traffic, that's not the Father. But the goal is the, we see, we, we worry. I mean, I don't care if you just did something horrible. Move right into centering him as, as the king. He's worthy because he's worthy because he's worthy. And you can find something to begin to move you into worship. The trees, 
They worship. Look at them. I can see them right now. When the wind hits, they worship. And you just join all of creation and begin to worship. When you see, you do. So in Romans, he's saying, yeah, you've been set free from sin, but now you're a slave to God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is everlasting life. That's the key. Worship and see. And, and we're going we're gonna to go more into this um, next month. I re- I'm, God's really been speaking to me, and I want a couple times where we talk about our, who we are as kings and priests and how we're to rule in the nations. As a priest, we are intercessors. Those of you that are moving into the things of God, it's to intercede for your family. It's to release forgiveness. It's to, okay? As kings, you go in and you decree and you set things in order. But a king understands authority. Okay, so a king gets direct instructions from the king of kings and decrees and sets things in order. But the, the children of Israel, really quick, were moving from being immature to maturing as sons and daughters. That's what's happening. And we're all in different places in that. And it's all beautiful and God loves all of it and he's not mad at you over any of it. Okay, if you're still in the third grade in one area, he's just trying to give you the tools to move you to the fourth grade. It's fine, right? And we're going to get this, okay? If you, what is it? My, your, my uncle was the only one with a beard in the fourth grade, right? All right. But it's an immature people. The children of Israel, they just wanted manna. After 430 years of slavery, and they're finally released. They move into the freedom, okay? But it was free to move into dominion, but they didn't take the dumb. They just got free. So he was freeing them to move them into dominion. The goal was always to bring his people unto himself to give them the promised land. That was always the goal, okay? But the immature people, and this is the thing I'm just like, okay, God, they just wanted the food from heaven. Satisfy me now, God. It's immaturity where God has to manifest, has to manifest where I can see. That's immaturity in my life. In other words, you've been praying about this one area and you haven't seen God move. It's immaturity where you lock in that you you can't see that he's good beyond that unless you can see it. And then once you see the miracle and you're dancing, they all were dancing around the miracles. That's easy. It's those that worship when you don't see the miracles. That's the maturity. That's what brings maturity. That's what moves you into governing. When you don't understand, it's denying your soul altogether. So they wanted miracles. They, they demanded that God would manifest himself. Guys, it's maturity. We are beginning to mature as sons and daughters when we'll worship a God we don't see. And I mean when we don't see, the, he's not answering. It feels like he's not answering. Well, we worship him because we can breathe, because you're amazing. I worship him because you're amazing, because your eyeballs are just amazing. And when, when, when you're his favorite, we won't tell anybody. Okay. And when, when, when Dave came in this place, it changed the atmosphere, didn't it? Right? When she, we vote for Dave. That's a T-shirt. Dave is his favorite. <laughs> but I mean, if you can't see his goodness in your life because all you're seeing is the miracle you need, you've got to shake it off. You've got to get way, away from that so that belief system doesn't begin to define your life. When Gary could see, he took his son out and he had to re, reprogram his thinking until he could see that God is good. And then he went out and said what he was going to get and shot it. He's teaching us how to govern. An immature people exalt their opinions. That's the murmuring and complaining. That's what do you think we should do? You think we should go another round? You know, you think this was supposed to last 40 years? <laughs> what do you think? I don't know. We're, we keep following this guy. I mean, he did a lot of miracles, but, you know. They exalt their opinion. It's a mature person that only exalts the word of the Lord. And now I'm talking to myself, you guys, because... Our opinions, I'm talking about the way we think. The quicker you don't listen here, the quicker you can move into obedience. So 
So Joshua and Caleb, there was only two. If, if you guys don't mind the worship team, go ahead and come. There was only two. That's so tragic, isn't it? I mean, how many? How many thousands did he take out of Egypt? Like 400,000, and they probably isn't the children. Yeah, like a million. This was the call on Moses' life. The miracles, like I've never seen these kind of miracles. Has anyone here seen these kind of miracles? None of their clothes wore out. They were given all the finances they needed for the next whole, you know, to establish everything they needed. Miracles, signs, and wonders didn't change the attitude of their heart. Only two. Only two. Guys, I know we all think that we would be the two, but I have to go before God and say, God, I want to be the two. (laughs) God, I don't want to exalt my own opinion. God, I don't want you know, to be lifting up what I want, or I don't want to lock in on what I have to see you do in order for you to be good. God, you're good because you're good because you're good. You're just good, Lord. If, if I don't feel that I'm experiencing your goodness, it doesn't matter because you're good. Guys, I'm telling you this. I know it's really simple, but these are the keys, God's house, that we can continue to move forward in this. I mean, you've memorized a lot of the scriptures, right? Lucy, it's amazing. But it's that heart of a worshiper that causes you to see. That causes you to see. And that's when you worship when it doesn't look like it's good. Father, I just thank you for for your people here, God. God, I I know that you're strategic. (laughs) And you know what you're doing, God. and, And you gathered us together to know you, God. God, we're so honored to hear this message that as it's unfolding, Lord, we're so honored to have access to your word, Lord. We're so honored, God, to be born and to live during this time, to live in this city, God. God, we're so honored to be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. 